Hello and welcome once again to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelny, your instructor this semester, and we are going to be going into our second week now of our 16-week adventure together. Uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, the structure of games. We're going to be exploring in Chapter 2 of your Game Design Workshop book what does it mean for something to be a game? Turns out the, defancer, the answer may not be quite definitive, but we're going to learn some common terminology that help us to define what is a game. Um, let's look at two games. Your book looks at a couple of games. We're going to look at a couple of games. We're going to look at Cityville and Chess. Those things are both considered games, although they're quite different from each other. And, Cityville, um, you've got some forms of game-like activity. In chess, you have some forms of game-like activity. You have an opponent in chess. You don't really have an opponent in Cityville, although it is a massively multiplayer game. You have an outcome in chess. You have kind of an ongoing outcome in Cityville. We'll look at all these terms and concepts throughout uh, today's lecture. Um, it almost seems like these things have nothing in common, and yet we consider them both to be games. Let's talk about why. Um, first question, must a game have a computer or a game console? The answer should be no. There were games long before we had computers, although an awful lot of the games that we play today do involve uh, microprocessors. Uh, what about a ball, like a baseball or a basketball or a deck of cards? Huge numbers of games use those things. But a game doesn't need to have a ball or a deck of cards or a computer or a console to be a game. How about a point score? Does every game have a score? Well, we just looked at chess. Can you play chess without a point score? You, you can. Some people have used a scoring system. Uh, most people just play till checkmate, and that is the end of the game. You can play it without points. Um, must a game have players? Oh, OK, all those other things we named, a game may or may not have. But these things, these players, without players, it may not be a game. Let's consider that. Um, the purpose in general, definitionally, of any game is for the experience of the players. There really aren't other forms of entertainment I can think of that do the, exactly that. That have the players having some kind of experience or the consumers like that. Let's look at entertainment that doesn't have players. Talked about some of these last time. Films. You're sitting there watching a film on your television or in a theater. You're not a player in that case. Music, you will be listening to music uh, privately, maybe on your iPod or at a concert hall or some venue like that. You're not really a player. A book, you're reading a book and consuming the story that takes place within that book. You're not really a player when you're doing that. Or you're looking at artwork for entertainment uh, and consuming what has been created by the artist uh, visually. You're not really a player when you're doing that. And I would argue if you're watching one of those films in which you make some choices, or a book in which you make some choices, uh, or if there's such a thing as music where you make some choices and there's a different outcome, I would argue those are games, as we'll see in a few minutes. Okay, with very few exceptions, the consumer of those things is passive. And I'm going to argue that as soon as the consumer becomes active, it becomes a game. All right, game players are active. Game players make decisions. You move your chess pieces to attack or block your opponents. And your skill, your choices, your muscles, whatever you've got that it defines you as a player in that game affects the outcome of that game. 
players are, in fact, invested in the outcome. You care about the outcome. You are motivated to perform well, or you may perform poorly. You may win, you may lose. And as a player, you care about that outcome. That's what makes you enjoy the game. Players have objectives. That's why you care about the outcome. There are specific goals that the player will have in the game. In Plants vs. Zombies here, you have a goal of defending your front porch from the zombies as they march across your front lawn. In Evil Clutches, you have the goal of rescuing your babies for lots of points and shooting demons that are threatening you for fewer points. And your goal is to get as many points as you possibly can. Games have outcomes like checkmate that determines a winner or a loser who is happy, who is successful. Now other forms of entertainment like movies have outcomes. The, uh, this is the final scene of the great classic silent film Battleship Potemkin. And uh, the outcome of that film and uh, classic stories like uh, Joseph Conrad's uh, novella Heart of Darkness they have outcomes. And you never affect that outcome as the consumer of the film or book. In other words, no matter how many times I watch this communist propaganda film, Battleship Potemkin, the glorious communists will always overthrow their rich oppressors in the revolution. And no matter how many times you read Heart of Darkness, the ending always comes down to the horror, the horror. And no matter how many times you read Gulliver's Travels, uh, Gulliver always ends up con uh, concluding that uh, all humans are yahoos, I believe is the conclusion of that story. The reader has no control over that outcome, or the viewer. Let's look at these types of stories. Uh, game players must always have some control over the outcome, although, uh, let's see, uh, there are some where that, that control or the outcome is disappointing, as we've seen in recent years. Uh, that final outcome is unknown until the end. Your, the skill and effort you put into it uh, causes it to happen. The outcome may be equal or unequal. You may have very few poker chips at the end of the poker game while your opponent has lots of poker chips at the end of the game. Or the game may be a tie. There are ways in which the outcome of a game can be equal. All right, another thing games have that other forms of entertainment don't have, I will challenge you to think about this. Games have procedures. Procedures are a very important topic that we talk about in this class. Procedures are the ways in which players interact with the game. And I would challenge you to think of any game where players have no procedures. Um, they might be pressing buttons or keys or a mouse. They may be throwing balls. They may be moving pieces on a board. They may be turning their Wii steering wheel. But they're interacting somehow with the game. And those ways they interact, we call procedures in this class. In a console game, the procedures might be pressing the buttons on the console, moving the little sticks on the controller. And procedures, it turns out, are kind of unique to games. If you're the audience of a film or a play or a concert, you haven't got much in the way of procedures for interacting with your entertainment. I suppose there are some occasions where a musician or a band or orchestra or something will take requests. I guess that is a procedure for interacting with that entertainment. But for the most part, you are a passive consumer of the entertainment in all of these things except for 
games, except for games. All right. Moving along. Another thing about games. This is a very important fact. And this will be a test question you will run into. All games have rules. It's not that, no, there's a game out there that has no rules. If it has no rules, it probably isn't a game. Just like if it has no players, it probably isn't a game. There are one or two very kind of highfalutin examples we may discuss later on. But in general, we consider games to have rules just as much as they have players. The film, however, within the context of the film, the viewer of the film really doesn't have rules. Now, I suppose in the context of the movie theater, there are rules you must obey. But there aren't rules that uh, define how you interact with a film or a play or a book or a piece of music or a piece of art, et cetera, et cetera. You just passively consume those things without any rules. All right, all games have rules. There are the rules for straight poker that come in a deck of bicycle playing cards. Kind of as an example of rules. And a game of cards will have rules. There will be a procedure for interacting with your cards. There will be a hierarchy of what card has what role in the game, and uh, which cards are possibly more powerful than other cards, and what combinations are dominant over other combinations. Uh, example of a computer game rule, if you've ever played Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator, uh, for example, you will have defensive shields, and this is kind of common in computer games, especially science fictional ones, you will have some kind of defensive shields that will absorb damage up to a certain damage limit. After that, the spaceship itself will begin taking damage from the enemy weapons. And the enemy ships also have shields and they will take damage after internal damage after those shields are down. That's kind of a common rule. And that's exactly what you would call it. You'd call that a rule in this context. A uh, rule for um, this would be a bejeweled game where uh, you will have procedures for interacting with it. You will click on a certain jewel and move it in a certain direction to make certain combination. And that procedure is a rule. Every procedure, in fact, is a rule. But not all rules are procedures. If I were to hit the space bar playing my evil clutches, my dragon will launch a fireball at that demon. That's a procedure. The fireball will hit the demon and destroy it. That's a rule. I will get points for the destroyed demon. That's a rule. Those aren't procedures, though. That's not a way I interact with the game. My procedure is pressing that space bar. Um, if I don't hit a target, my fireball will just go off the end of the screen and be destroyed by the rules that you have programmed into the game. That's a rule. It is not a procedure. Be clear on all procedures are rules, but there are many rules that are not procedures. Moving along further. Going quickly today. All right, games also have resources. Resources are items the player may use. Their value comes from their scarcity and their uh, utility, like a big bad sword you might be carrying in a game um, might be a resource that you would use in that game. Um, in this case, that is Chaos Eater. Uh, what's the name of that game that's got Chaos Eater, anybody? Uh, Oh, really? Dark Siders? Yeah, no? No? Okay. Uh, or bridge or poker or a uh, game like that where you have cards and there's only one ace of hearts. It is scarce and it has certain usefulness. In, uh, yeah, I think that's a hand of bridge. Ooh, that's a really good position to be in. Um, so you would uh, deploy your resources. Um, 
and their scarcity and utility make them valuable to you. And you don't just randomly spew out your resources, you use them to your advantage. All right, and this card of hands has a strong suit in hearts if you understand how uh, a bridge works. Okay, games have boundaries. Even massively open games in a computer have some kind of boundary, like uh, Grand Theft Auto 4 pictured there. Uh, sometimes the boundaries are very, very simple and obvious. This is a sector a spaceship is patrolling in Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator, and these are the limits of that space sector. Uh, as the game exists right now, you cannot go beyond the limits of that sector, neither can your enemies. Every place, every bit of action in this game takes place within that map board. Um, in a card game, let's think about the concept of a boundary. Um, in the case of a game of bridge or poker or something, the boundary may be a social convention. That is a time convention. I am committed to continue playing this game until it reaches its conclusion. And that would be your boundary. The game will have some kind of concluding moment, taking a certain number of tricks, a certain number of hands, a rubber, etc., would be the boundary of the game. In basketball, you've obviously got the boundaries of the court, but there are boundaries within the court that are parts of rules. If you go out of bounds, there are certain things that happen. Often that implies a turnover of possession of the ball in basketball. But we've also got this thing, the three-point line. A shot beyond the, from beyond the three-point line is worth three points. A shot within the three-point line is worth two points. That is a rule, or those are rules in this game of basketball. So these boundaries are rules. But again, not all rules are boundaries. So there are many, many, many different classifications of rules we're talking about here. All right, games also have, moving along, conflict. It can be conflict from players performing against some kind of challenging obstacle, like a maze or a puzzle. This is from the game Koalabrate you'll be making in a couple of weeks where you're making your little koala bears run around in a maze. Um, this is a case of solving a puzzle. You don't have an opposing player, not really any artificial intelligence against you. It is really a puzzle you're uh, performing against. And a maze is an example of a puzzle. But the conflict could be opposing players that are trying to score more points or more runs than you might score. And you may perform against these other players in real time, as you do in a massively multiplayer online game, typically. And the games have conflict sometimes where you perform against each other asynchronously. Here is the uh, Facebook game Car Town, where you can collect cars and you can race against each other. And you race asynchronously. I might run my race at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You might run your race at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then the computer will determine which of us won that race. And it's a kind of a silly game mechanic, but it's popular anyway. All right, games always offer challenge in some way. Um, there are some books that you might read that might be challenging in a different way. Um, in the case of Galactic Mail, that uh, many of us will start working on today, you've got a rocket ship that is going to land on moons to deliver the mail and score points. Your rocket ship must avoid crashing into asteroids because it can't survive a collision with an asteroid. The game is over and the player is dead. Well, the character the player plays is dead. Games may offer dramatic elements, too. And we're going to get into dramatic elements in great detail in a couple of weeks. Um, dramatic elements may be a premise. This game, Railroad Empire, another Facebook game made locally here in the Cleveland area, um, where the premise is you are a great railroad magnate trying to set up railroad lines from city to city across the continent. And uh, 
build a great empire with lots of locomotives and lots of track making lots of money. That's the premise of that game. There may be characters in the game. Here we have uh, characters in, um, uh, what's the name of that game? Uh, uh, Red Dead. Red Dead Redemption. We have some characters there. They have personalities. In this case, they have voices and they interact with each other. Um, many games have characters. Not all of them do, but characters are a dramatic element. Many games have a story. If there's a story, and we'll talk about the structure of a story in a couple of weeks, that will have a, a plot. And uh, we'll talk about what that is. And the plot will have some kind of beginning and some kind of climax and some kind of ending. And if that happens, it has a story for the characters to go through. That is a dramatic element. Now, not all games have these things. Not all games have a premise or characters or a story. Uh, poker, billiards, darts, really. They're games, but they don't really have those elements. But a lot of the popular computer games, more and more we're seeing these dramatic elements built into them. And it takes a lot to make a game that's got these things. All right. This week, we're going to have an online discussion about this topic. We're going to be asking and discussing what is a game. I'm going to ask your opinion. You should get on there and discuss with your classmates your ideas of what is a game. Throw out some examples of gameness and maybe not gameness. We'll have a lively, lively discussion, I think. And then we're also going to talk this week in lecture, we won't talk th about this online, about serious games and simulations. This is another kind of branch of games that is not so much discussed in your book, but it's important to mention at this point because these things we call serious games don't always have all the elements that we say a game has, yet we still use the word game to describe them. The purpose of a serious game might be educational. It might be therapeutic. You might be learning something about medicine or human anatomy. You might be, as in the case of uh, this game, um, using a helmet that's reading my brain waves to control this whale on the TV screen. No hands game. No hands, no voice, no nothing. My control uh, in this game, the procedure, is brain waves. My procedure is to concentrate in the case of this game. And this game is intended to uh, treat um, attention deficit disorder, ADD. Um, the idea is it teaches me to concentrate better. It teaches me to turn on those high energy, high concentration brain waves. Um, we have this for the serious games and simulations class. If you go on to take that class, uh, you'll get to use this and experiment with it and um, write about it, find out all about how to use brain waves as a ga game controller. Is there a future in that for entertainment games? Maybe. Maybe one of you is going to figure out how to use brain waves to uh, control a fun, popular game. But for the time being, we have a game used for therapy in this example. Purpose of a serious game may also be experimental. You may be creating a factory layout and finding out, well, if I make this tank uh, 5,000 gallons, What's my throughput of my chemical process? If I make it 6,000 gallons, what happens? That would be an experimental thing to use a serious game for. Um, you still have control over the outcome. In this case, this is a game uh, we might use in this class. They use it in some of the engineering classes where you rearrange this factory, you rearrange the machines in the factory uh, based on the workflows of all the jobs to try and make material handling uh, as minimized as you possibly can. And it turns out that when you move one machine to make one job more efficient, you may be making another job less efficient. So you try to come up with an optimal arrangement. And there are zillions of different possible arrangements of this factory for those jobs. 
Um, and so it's an experiment that you can conduct. And it's a lot easier and cheaper than actually getting equipment and moving the machines around in a real factory. Oh, another thing about serious games, the outcomes may not all be unequal. And the goal of the game may be just to learn the rules. This is Ion Field, which was made for our chemistry classes here at Lorain County Community College. Ion Field is a kind of a Tetris game, a pattern game, where you're trying to learn the octet rule. And if you're very good at understanding the octet rule, which of these chemicals can be brought together to make uh, chemical compounds, then you will score very well. And as you get better and better and quicker and quicker at making your compounds, um, you will score better and better, and you will, as a result, be learning the octet rule of chemistry. It's pretty cool. All right, other possible serious games. Guitar Hero, Rock Band, DJ Hero. These games are all a little bit serious. You do learn a little bit about music from playing these games, and mastering these games does give you a little bit of a skill and understanding of music. But here's my favorite thing about serious games. Um, I had an older chart that was more impressive, but this is the most recent data I was able to find. From 2008, this data came out comparing 2007 sales figures. Serious games, we are looking at $10.5 billion market. You know how you've heard all your life that entertainment games were a bigger market than movies and a bigger market than books and a bigger market than music, and that's true. Serious games are even bigger than that. You could, everyone in this class, might make yourself a good career in making serious games, games that are educational or experimental. You'll get a little bit of a chance to get a taste of that in our degree program. Um, I invite you to pursue that. It can be a very, very lucrative career. And uh, I hope you take the Serious Games and Simulations class later on to find out more about it. Coming up next time, we're going to talk about what makes a good game and maybe what makes a bad game. We'll uh, cite examples of bad games next week, and we're going to have a very uh, we're going to have a conversation with an attitude next week. In the meantime, this is Mike Substelny here at Lorain County Community College signing off for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations.